Hi and welcome. This is the first episode of a series looking at the Shakespeare plays that inspired Verneville's lore. You probably know that the love story between Romeo Monti and Juliet Cap was inspired by Romeo and Juliet, but that's not all. Most of the Veronaville residents and their ancestors were named after Shakespeare characters. The goal of this series is to get to know these characters so we can better understand what Max is intended for the neighborhood. The lore of Veronaville is pretty nebulous. The game does give you clues as to what happened in the neighborhood before you start playing, but they're pretty sparse and it's sometimes difficult to determine if something is significant or if it's an oversight by Maxis. All we know for sure is that the Caps and the Montes hate each other, except for Juliet Cap and Romeo Monty, who have a crush on each other, and of course their relationship causes a lot of drama. And then there's the Summer Dream family, who have friends on both sides and don't hate anyone. Also, they have a fairy aesthetic going on, which has roots in Shakespeare as well, but we'll get to that. So by looking at Shakespeare closely, I'm hoping we can make some connections and flesh out our theories about Veronaville's lore, especially when it comes to the diseased ancestors who we don't really know much about from the game alone. Each episode is going to focus on one play, starting with Twelfth Night. I read these plays in modern English because it's easy on my brain, so when I'm quoting the text, I'll actually be quoting a modern English translation of the original. In the case of Twelfth Night, there is a modern English translation freely available online. The link is below if you want to check it out. Twelfth Night, or What You Will, is a comedy that Shakespeare wrote in 1601 or 1602. You might have seen Andy Fickman's movie She's the Man, starring Amanda Bynes. Well, fun fact, it was actually inspired by this play. In Twelfth Night, we'll get to see Olivia, Maria, Antonio, Viola, and there's also a character called Valentine, but he's so secondary that there isn't much to say about him. We'll come back to Valentine in the next episode. When the play starts, Lady Olivia, a wealthy duchess in the land of Valeria, is in deep mourning after her father, and more recently her brother, died. She's so afflicted that she vows to stay in mourning and not to show her face to the world for seven years. The Duke of Valeria, de Corsino, is desperately in love with her. He's intent on pursuing her and he wants to make her his wife, but she doesn't care about him and she wishes he'd stop annoying her. Then, with that situation as a background, we're introduced to Viola. Viola is a young lady who survived a shipwreck and landed on the shore of Valeria. She thinks that her twin brother, Sebastian, who was traveling with her, died in the wreckage. In order to survive in this new place, she disguises herself as a man and takes the name of Cesario so that she can be hired as a page by Duke Orsino and make a living for herself. Viola manages to fool Orsino with her disguise and she quickly becomes his favorite servant. As she spends time with him, she falls in love with Orsino, but has to hide both her feelings and her true identity. Orsino doesn't notice anything, and he even sends her to Countess Olivia as a messenger to still try and convince her to accept his love. But instead of reciprocating the Duke's feelings, Olivia falls in love with Viola, who she thinks is Cesario. So we're in a love triangle situation. Orsino loves Olivia, who loves Cesario Viola, who loves Orsino. Now let's talk about Maria. Maria is a gentlewoman at the service of Olivia. She's Olivia's handmaid. She's quite clever and witty. She's one of the most overtly funny characters of the play, along with Sir Toby Belch, who is Olivia's uncle, and Sir Andrew, a friend of his. To give you a taste of the play and of Maria's character, I tried my best to stage an excerpt of Act 1, Scene 3. I made some slight modifications to the modern English translation that I pulled from.
A dirty joke was lost in the translation of that scene. It's just too hard to recreate in the text without a footnote and beyond my ability to recreate in The Sims 3 animation. Shakespeare uses a lot of salacious humor. In Shakespeare, it's often pretty straightforward which characters the audience is supposed to root for. They are the characters that are the wittiest. Unfortunately, the measure of how clever Shakespearean lines are is often lost on modern audiences because of how much the English language has changed. It's hard to understand what the actors are even saying sometimes. That's why modern English translations can be nice, even though subtleties of the original can get lost. But anyway, hopefully you were able to tell from this little machinima that Maria and Sir Toby are the witty ones that the audience is meant to laugh with, while Sir Andrew comes off as awkward and pretty dense. He takes everything literally and misses all the puns. He's getting owned by two people whose mastery of language exceeds his own. He's the one to be laughed at. So Maria is supposed to be sympathetic, while not exactly being a paragon of honesty. Later on, she instigates a prank on Malvolio, a steward of Olivia's, to give him a lesson for being so full of himself and annoying. The prank is this. Maria's handwriting is very similar to Olivia's, so she writes a fake letter pretending to be Olivia, in which she implies very heavily that Olivia is in love with Malvolio, and she encourages him to wear yellow stockings and smile like an idiot in Olivia's presence, because it would please her very much. Of course, Olivia isn't actually in love with him at all. She hates his yellow stockings, and when he shows up smiling and behaving like an absolute fool because he's convinced that she secretly loves him, she thinks that he's gone mad and she has him locked up. Which Maria, Sir Toby Belch, and Sir Andrew find hilarious, of course. While all of that is happening around Olivia, Viola's brother Sebastian has actually survived the shipwreck along with the sea captain Antonio, and they've both also landed in Illyria. They think Viola drowned, and they're not hoping to see her alive again. Antonio knows his way around Illyria, and so he becomes Sebastian's guide. From then follows a cascade of comical situations, based on the fact that Sebastian looks exactly like Cesario, or Viola disguised as Cesario, because Viola and Sebastian are twins. Physically, people talk to Sebastian thinking that he's Cesario, and then when they confront Cesario about what Sebastian did, Viola has no idea what they're talking about. This, for instance, results in Olivia asking Sebastian to marry her, thinking that he's Cesario, and he has no idea what's going on, but he's like, sure, a rich beautiful lady is in love with me out of nowhere and wants to marry me, let's do it, as you do. And then of course Viola is very confused when Olivia calls her husband. But at the end of the play, Viola and Sebastian are finally reunited. They realize that they are in fact both alive, and Viola reveals her true identity and confesses her love to Duke Orsino. Orsino enthusiastically accepts to marry her, Olivia happily stays married to Sebastian, and all is for the best. In the play, Olivia is a character who is more driven by her emotions than by power or money. At the start of the play, she is very affected by her brother's death. She puts on a black veil over her face and vows not to show herself to the world for seven years, which, when you think about it, is a bit extreme. But when she meets Viola Cesario for the first time, she's already starting to fall in love and Cesario doesn't have to ask her twice to lift her veil and so, by that, go back on her vow. Also, the fact that she's never at all tempted to give in to the advances of Duke Orsino, who is higher ranking than her, suggests that she does not care for a union that would be socially advantageous to her. In Act 1, Scene 3, Sir Toby Belch says about her, This remark foreshadows who Olivia is going to end up marrying by the end of the play, but it also serves to show a bit of her character. It isn't antithetical with Sims 2 Olivia's family aspiration, although Sims 2 Olivia does have a high interest in money. Another facet of Olivia's character in Shakespeare is that she doesn't get swayed by compliments. She doesn't like small talk, and she sees through flattery. There's a passage in Act 1, Scene 5 that illustrates that. It's her first time meeting Cesario, who was sent by Orsino to basically compliment her on his behalf.
Viola isn't playing this game of ritual politeness with any enthusiasm either, but you can tell what kind of tone Olivia takes when someone tries to flatter her, and so Orsino can try to praise her and elevate her all he wants, it leaves her completely cold. She doesn't love him, and nothing he says will change that. She does like the idea of marriage with the right person though, and at the end of the play she's happy to be married to Sebastian. She's even the one who asks for Sebastian's hand. So yeah, that sounds like family sim behavior to me, which is what Olivia Monti is. In The Sims 2, Olivia is one of the rare diseased ancestors who has a bio and also a personality. She's fairly sloppy, quite outgoing, rather lazy and serious, and rather nice. Twelve Nights Olivia is even more serious, I think. She does come off as a tad melodramatic. She's probably less outgoing as well, although maybe the fact that she's in mourning makes her seem less outgoing than she otherwise would be. I think she's grouchier than she's nice, although again, the memory of her brother's death might have something to do with that, and she doesn't come off as particularly lazy or active. If I had to redefine Olivia Monti's personality to have her reflect Shakespeare's Olivia, she would be something like this. What's very unique about Olivia Monti in The Sims 2 is that she appears to have died while pregnant. In the vanilla game, you'll find a bond resurrecting her that her pregnancy is in fact only a mesh and she won't actually give birth, but this, in conjunction with Olivia's bio, suggests that Maxis may have intended us to get the idea that she died from complications related to her pregnancy. While Olivia loves her children and always wanted a big family, will her next birth push her over the edge? As we saw, there isn't anything in Twelve Nights Olivia that ties into this, unfortunately. It's interesting that in The Sims 2, Olivia isn't married to Sebastian, but to Claudio. We'll talk about Claudio soon when we look at Measure for Measure. In fact, there is no character named Sebastian in Veronaville, so if you're looking for a name to give to a descendant of the Monty family in your game, Sebastian is one you could use as a reference to this play. Viola is the namesake of Viola Possibly Monty, who's a resident of Verneville who was deleted during development. So she doesn't actually exist in the finished game, although according to the Sims wiki, she is referenced in the game files as a former inhabitant of 111 Stratford Street. An early beta screenshot of the lot shows a sim who is probably Viola with Olivia and Mercutio Monty. The screenshot shows a teen with long straight blonde hair and skin 3. Still, according to the Sims wiki, she may have been intended as Mercutio and Romeo's sister. Her blonde hair and skin 3 do seem to hint at her possibly being Olivia's daughter. Think of Olivia's bio as well. This is just me speculating, but I feel like this emphasis on her loving her children and wanting a big family makes more sense if she already has three children before her last pregnancy instead of two. In Shakespeare's play, Viola and Olivia are very similar. They have both lost their father and their brother, also Viola thinks, and they are both in unrequited love with someone. Their names are also similar, which may not have been an accident. Viola is described as rather beautiful and clever. She's very resourceful, she's stranded on foreign ground after the ship she was on sank, and she does pretty well for herself in the end. And although she becomes employed as a servant in Orsino's court, she's fairly high-born, she's educated and she can speak well. If I were to assign Twelfth Night's Viola a Sims 2 personality, she'd be something like this. Viola could be a lovely name to give to a baby girl born in the Monty Clan near Veronaville. It could be an homage to Maxis's Viola, who was scrapped during development. Or if you don't acknowledge her as part of the canon, it could be a reference to Twelfth Night, or an homage to Olivia, who has strong ties to her in the play. In The Sims 2, Maria's last name is Arlecchino after she marries Trinculo. Arlecchino is Italian for Harlequin. Arlecchino is the archetype of the clown in the Commedia dell'arte, an Italian theatrical genre that flourished in the 16th through to the 18th century. The influence of the Commedia pushed well past the borders of Italy and can still be seen in media today. It's massive, and I'll definitely talk about it again in the context of Monty family lore. But anyway, it makes sense that Maxis gave Maria the name Arlecchino if she was inspired by the Maria from Twelfth Night. Like Harlequin, she's definitely a trickster, and she's definitely clever. 
Seems to Maria being a base game diseased ancestor, she has missing data, including her blank personality. But from what we've just seen, I think it would be fitting for her to have plenty of points in playful and outgoing. And I think it's fair to say that she'd be quite grouchy as well. Antonio is a name that comes up in many Shakespeare plays. In Twelfth Night, Antonio is a secondary character, but he still has quite a distinctive personality. He's very protective of Sebastian, he even says that he adores him. He literally implores Sebastian to let him be his guide in Illyria. Sebastian doesn't know Illyria at all, while Antonio does. However, Antonio is in danger staying here because he and his city stole something from Illyria in the past. It's not super clear what happened, but Duke Orsino now considers him an enemy. Still, Antonio minimizes the issue and he insists on staying with Sebastian to help him around. There's a YouTube channel called Chorus Hero that has a scene-by-scene -scene breakdown of Twelfth Night. And in two of those videos, they sort of analyze the relationship between Antonio and Sebastian. They're both in the description. And the professor who speaks, Regina Bucola, she equates Antonio's love for Sebastian as the love that a father has for his son and Sebastian lost his father when he was 13. I agree that it's an interpretation that makes sense. However, I don't claim to know more than this professor about any of this, but sometimes several interpretations are possible, and reading the modernized version of the play, I couldn't help but perceive Antonio's love as maybe a romantic love. Also, later on, Viola, still disguised as Cesario, is attacked by Sir Andrew. Antonio sees this, and thinking that Viola is Sebastian, he puts himself in between them to defend who he thinks is Sebastian. Right after that, officers under the orders of Duke Orsino come to arrest Antonio, because again, he's a wanted man in Illyria, and he says to you who he thinks is Sebastian. So yeah, Antonio is obviously very attached to Sebastian, and it seems to me that there could be some romantic attraction there. So if you're looking for an excuse to get some diversity in your Veronaville and have Antonio be gay or bi in your game, here it is. Or maybe not gay because he was married to a hero before she died, but bi could work. And obviously, I'm sure that by now you've picked up on the queer themes of the play, that love triangle between Orsino, Olivia, and Cesario Viola that we discussed earlier is maybe not that straight. And about that, keep in mind that in Shakespeare's time, women were not allowed to perform on a stage, so the characters of Olivia and Viola would have been played by men. Actually, since Viola disguises herself as a man, the actor playing her would be a man playing a woman playing a man, which was supposed to add layers to the theme of acting as someone else, which is quite meta. If you're interested in seeing what that looks like, the original practices production of Twelfth Night that I saw went with actors who are all men even to play women's parts. It will be linked in the description. And that's about it for the links between Twelfth Night and The Sims of Veronaville. As I said, Twelfth Night also has a character called Valentine, like Patricio Monti's father, but there's basically nothing to say about that character because he's so secondary. But luckily, Valentine is also one of the two gentlemen of Verona, which is the play we're going to look at next time. We'll also be talking about Sylvia, Proteus, Julia, Lucetta, Theorio, and Antonio some more. 
So that's it. I hope you enjoyed this episode. Feel free to call me out in the comments if I missed something and maybe come back for the next episode if you're interested. Bye!